between clearing the deck at a moment, but bienvenue, mes, mesdames et messieurs. Je m'appelle Dr. Abby Angel, et je suis le président des Amis de IRSC. C'est avec plaisir d'être ici pour le forum public du Prix international Friesen. My job this afternoon is to introduce the platform party of uh, speakers as a warm-up to our featured guest, Dr. Shirley M. Tillman, president of Princeton University and the 2010 Friesen Prize laureate. This unique Canadian prize is named after Dr. Henry G. Friesen, an iconic figure in Canadian health research and policy development, who was instrumental in the creation of Canadian Institutes of Health Research 10 years ago. Dr. Friesen, identify yourself. <laughs> Dr. Friesen, so glad you're here. This is the fifth anniversary of the Friesen International Prize Award that features outstanding leaders at an international level. And the Friesen Prize supports an annual lecture by an accomplished individual in international stature on topics related to the advancement of health research and its fundamental value to society. In the past, we've had exceptional awardees, as shown in the next slide, uh, all of whom have held forth at events such as this and shared their experience and wisdom with all Canadians on a one-to-one -one basis on a, and on a national level uh, through the Internet. This year's Friesen Prize laureate, Dr. Shirley Tillman, president of Princeton University, has raised the stakes and set the bar even higher. And Shirley is the center of the stage. I will, know you will enjoy her presentation, and I'll leave the formal introduction to Principal Heather Monroe Bloom of McGill University, who's just to her left. Now, Friends of CIHR through the Friesen Prize program has had a productive collaboration with the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, and I would like to invite Dr. Catherine Whiteside, Dean of Medicine at the University of Toronto and President of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences to come to the podium and say a few words of, of welcome just before uh, your leader, President Alan Rock, gives you words of welcome and uh, wise words of guidance. So Catherine, please take the podium. Well, thanks very much, Dr. Angel, President Rock, Principal Monroe Bloom, Henry. It is a distinct honor for me to bring greetings and congratulations to the 2010 Friesen Award winner, Dr. Shirley Tillman, and a very special thanks to the Friends of CHR, stalwartly led by, for many years by you, Abby Angel. Thank you. Dr. Tillman, you are an outstanding role model for all leaders in academia and all who aspire to realize a life of significant global contribution in science. The excellence and innovation demonstrated, demonstrated by your scientific and senior administrative career are achieved by very few. We have all followed your progressive achievements and applauded your advancement of research and education that have had major societal impact. Your advocacy in promoting the careers of life scientists and women in science have meaningfully assisted to launch and sustain the careers of many new scholars. Thank you for your vision, creativity, and willingness to share your wealth of knowledge and understanding as part of these award proceedings today in Ottawa and as you are traveling for a couple of days in Ontario. The mission of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences is to provide scientific advice for a healthy Canada. Dr. Tillman, you are an inspiration for our members and all those we serve. Please accept our very best wishes for continued success and again, congratulations from our Academy. Well, thank you, Dr. Whiteside. I should point out that this event is being uh, streamed on the internet, as is tomorrow's talk at Queen's University, where Dr. Uh, Tillman will hold, hold forth. <coughs> now, I'm absolutely delighted to be here at uh, 
Tabaret Hall, this Art Deco uh, chamber is a spectacular history, but uh, it is uh, made up in part now by the advances uh, provided by the Honorable uh, President uh, Alan Rock, who has got a long-standing uh, history in the creation of CIHR and an equally long or even longer association with Dr. Henry Friesen, who's uh, the name prize. Uh, and it's absolutely a delight for me to invite you here with that kind of background and tradition to tell us how you went from uh, CIHR to the president of uh, this wonderful university. Distinguées invités, <coughs> mesdames et messieurs, euh, étudiants et étudiantes, membres de la, la communauté universitaire. Euh, je suis ravi d'avoir l'occasion cet après-midi de vous souhaiter la bienvenue ici euh, sur le campus de l'Université d'Ottawa et euh, de présenter cet événement euh, extraordinaire. Je voudrais également remercier nos partenaires euh, dans euh, la préparation euh, d'aujourd'hui, c'est-à-dire euh, les, les amis, les instituts de recherche en santé du Canada et euh, les académies de sciences. C'était comme toujours un grand plaisir pour nous euh, de travailler avec vous et je vous remercie pour votre euh, collaboration. Um, I must say that um, uh, although um, my friend and colleague uh, Heather Monroe Bloom principal of McGill University will introduce Dr. Tillman. I would like to take uh, this opportunity to say very briefly, um, especially uh, as a relative newcomer to a university campus, uh, what an inspiration it has been for me to read and to learn from uh, the insightful lectures and speeches uh, of Dr. Tillman in her capacity as president of Princeton University, as well as to watch and learn from the innovations she has introduced, uh, both uh, Dr. Tillman during your distinguished career as a scholar, and then as a university administrator, and now, of course, as a preeminent academic leader. Uh, I have been particularly impressed, if I may say so, with the commitment that Dr. Tillman has shown throughout her distinguished career um, in, in the importance of teaching uh, an appreciation of science and technology to students who are not involved in the sciences. It goes hand in hand with her interest uh, in explaining to the broader community the importance of education in the sciences and how exposure to the sciences can help the kinds of collaborations which really produce uh, collective advances. Today's events the lectures and then subsequently the CBC broadcasts will, I hope, be instruments that uh, will be helpful in your effort to broaden that message, Dr. Tillman. Let me say a few words about the Henry G. Friesen International Prize in Health Research, if I may. First, the person for whom it is named, Dr. Friesen, is here today, a scientist of international reputation, a leader in his field of research in the 1990s the president of the Medical Research Council, as it then was, c'était during the 90s that he conceived and inspired the creation of the Institute of Research in Santé du Canada. This remarkable innovation, which was uh, introduced uh, to me for the first time at a dinner party hosted uh, by Dr. Keon, Senator Wilbur Keon, who's here this afternoon, um, was really uh, genius in action. It was the essence of simplicity, but it was also the key to broadening the scope of health research, integrating it and making it uh, both uh, more productive and more useful to the benefit of, uh, of all Canadians. Um, he, il a travaillé sans relâche pour réaliser l'idée des instituts. Uh, il a développé un consensus pan-canadien parmi les chercheurs et les chercheuses pour faire avancer le projet. And so in 2005, the Friends of CIHR, in collaboration with the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, created this remarkable award to commemorate and perpetuate uh, our appreciation for Dr. Friesen's contribution. The award, which is announced each spring 
supports an annual fall lecture or series of lectures by a person chosen for their singular achievements and their international stature on topics related to the advancement of health research and its evolving contributions to society. The lecture endeavors to reach the broadest possible audience at major centers across Canada, and uh, we're just honored that uh, we are here this afternoon to hear the presentation by this year's recipient, Dr. Shirley Tillman. Now, may I present to you, to introduce Dr. Tillman, a person I'm proud to call a colleague and, uh, and friend, uh, Heather Monroe Bloom, who's the principal of McGill University. Heather? Uh, merci uh, beaucoup, uh, President Rock, and uh, uh, invité distingué, uh, cher, cher collègue étudiant, et uh, uh, les, les invités ici pour cet événement unique et uh, remarquable. And uh, Henry Friesen, it's fantastic to be with you as we uh, welcome our special guest who's receiving your award this year. C'est vraiment un très grand plaisir pour moi de souhaiter euh, la bienvenue à Présidente Shirley Tillman à l'occasion de form, euh, Forum Grand Public de euh, Prix Friesen. C'est un immense honneur de vous présenter cet éminent professeur qui a accepté de se joindre à nous aujourd'hui. It is truly a, a pleasure to introduce you, uh, Shirley Tillman, to this group today. Uh, Professor Tillman is a special daughter of Canada, endowed with a combination of qualities so rarely found in one person, a gifted teacher and mentor, an outstanding university leader, a warm, engaging person with exceptional human qualities. Simply put, as president of Princeton University, Dr. Tillman is one of the premier uh, academic leaders in the world. And I've had the distinct pleasure of working with uh, Dr. Tillman the last years uh, in the context of the American Association of Universities. But my conceit to association with Dr. Tillman is that we both succeeded the Shapiro brothers, uh, 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 Dr. Tillman succeeding uh, Harold Shapiro as the first woman uh, president of Princeton and me, uh, Dr. Bernard Shapiro, as the first woman principal of McGill. The subject of Dr. Tillman's address, Science and Enterprise as a Social Good, the Role of Universities, is of course more relevant today than it ever has been, and it is uh, emblematic of the uh, uh, values and commitments of Dr. Tillman. It speaks to the essence of the university's mission of marrying scholarship, uh, uh, research, and innovation with the opportunity to do social good and it very much highlights Dr. Tillman's own significant uh, contributions to our world, a world that so counts on the special contributions of respect, knowledge, informed debate, and courageous action. No one better exemplifies these than Dr. Tillman. Born in Toronto, uh, uh, Professor Tillman received an Honours Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from Queen's University, where she'll be greeted uh, tomorrow by her alma mater. Uh, and after two years um, teaching in Sierra Leone, she obtained her PhD in biochemistry from Temple University in Philadelphia. She then pursued doctoral studies at the National Institutes of Health, and it was during this period that Professor Tillman began the innovative research that led to one of her signature scientific contributions when she participated in the groundbreaking uh, cloning of the first mammalian gene. A distinguished molecular biologist, she went on to make further scientific breakthroughs while at the Institute for Cancer Research in Philadelphia and the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Tillman joined the faculty at Princeton as the Howard A. Pryor Professor of the Life Sciences in 1986, and she's held a range of distinctive positions at Princeton, subsequent uh, to her becoming the 19th president of Princeton University in 2001. Prior to that, she'd become the founding director of Princeton's multidisciplinary Lewis Siegler Institute for Integrative Genomics, and from 1993 until 2000, she served as chair of Princeton's Council on Science and Technology. She served in too many roles of distinction for me to enumerate, but I'll just mention a few. Uh, she was a member of the National Research Council Committee that set the blueprint 
for the U.S.'s participation in the Human Genome Project. She was a founder of the National Advisory Council on the Human Genome uh, Project Initiative for the National Institutes of Health in the United States. She's also served as a national leader, as has been uh, mentioned, uh, on behalf of scientists and in part, uh, but spe especially uh, women in science and in promoting the careers of young scientists. She's had a simply stunning impact in her role as university president. Uh, as uh, President Rock said, a special emphasis on um, uh, research teaching interface on the role that postdoctoral fellows can play in her university. She has reached out to the country locally and nationally, always sensitive to the broader impact of science on the community and making that accessible to uh, the community at large. She was appointed co-chair of the new Commission on Jobs, Growth, and Economic Development in the state of New Jersey. Professor Tillman is the recipient of many distinguished awards and honors, and to name just a few, the L'Oreal UNESCO Award for Women in Science in 2002, the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society for Developmental Biology in 2003, and in 2007, she was honored with the Genetic Society of America Medal for outstanding contributions to her field. She has served as an advisor to a host of national and international institutions and has been distinguished through her membership in a breathtaking array of elite academies, the American Philosophical Society, the National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, and the Royal Society of London. All this and mother to two wonderful children, Rebecca and Alex. A tremendously talented, dynamic, and dedicated administrator, scientist, and scholar, Shirley M. Tillman is a most deserving recipient of the Henry G. Friesen International Prize in Health Research, an award which recognizes truly exceptional innovation by a visionary health leader of international stature. Chers amis distingués invités, remerciement chaleureusement la professeure Shirley Tillman, présidente de l'Université Princeton, de sa présence parmi, parmi vous. Merci. Heather, um, thank you for that lovely introduction. And President Rock, thank you for your kind words as well. I, uh, I hope you're both available for my memorial service. <laughs> the only other thing I could think as I was listening to these beautiful introductions is I just wish my mother had been here. Um, it is a special honor for me to be introduced by Heather Monroe Bloom, who I have had the great pleasure of getting to know as a fellow university president uh, because of our joint association uh, with the AAU. Um, Miguel, as I think you will not mind if I say this, President Rock. Well, I'm going to say it anyway. Miguel is one of the jewels in the Canadian crown, and it could not have a more distinguished principal than the one it has right now. Um, she has really been a leader in Canada in, in doing exactly what she claimed I've been doing uh, at Princeton, which is speaking out on behalf of the importance of education and particularly the importance of science and innovation as a way to create economic prosperity. So Heather, it's really a pleasure to be with you here today. President Rock, I am so grateful for you to uh, give me a chance to speak in a former chapel. I also wish my mother were here to see this. Um, and uh, especially knowing the very important role that you played during the time when Dr. Friesen was making his uh, truly important contributions to medical research here in Canada. Each one of you today has told me that the credit belongs to the other. Uh, from my perspective, what I could see is just a tremendous partnership. So it's really uh, a great pleasure uh, to be able to speak in your university. Um, 
The last thing I want to, uh, or perhaps not last, in fact, I'm going to say quite a bit today, uh, but I do want to thank uh, Dr. Angel, who has been just a wonderful host in arranging uh, my visit to Canada, in, in making this, uh, these three or four days just a, an enormous pleasure, and for the leadership that he has provided to Canada through his work in the Friends of CIHR. Uh, Dr. Angel, thank you so much uh, for what you have been doing, uh, both uh, in the last few days, but more importantly, what you've been doing in, in Canada. <laughs> and of course, I want to say a few words about my fellow Winnipegger, Dr. Henry Friesen, who is the reason we are gathered here today. Uh, I said to a group of people this morning at breakfast that when I first learned from Dr. Angel that I would um, be receiving this award, I went onto Google, which is the way we acquire all new information these days, and I read about his extraordinary career, um, his work uh, in science, uh, particularly his important work with prolactin and its role in uh, fertility. I read about the impact that he had had on medical education in this country. I read about the seminal role that he played in the creation of CIHR and then uh, with Genome Canada. And all of these articles that I read about him uh, led me to feel even more privileged that I was going to be receiving an award in his honor. But I have to say that after spending last evening at dinner with him and having a chance to hear directly from him about his life and hearing what his colleagues had to say about the impact that he has had on their careers, I can say uh, this afternoon that I am even more honored than I was before. It is a great privilege, Henry, uh, to be speaking here uh, in your name. So thank you for what you've done for Canada. Now, I wish, and I can't tell you how much I wish, that I could stand here and move back and forth between French and English as seamlessly as my two other university colleagues just did. But I can tell you, if I tried to do so, it would not be pretty. So I'm going to spare you uh, the uh, sight of my stumbling in French, and I am going to um, with some embarrassment, uh, speak today to you in English. Uh, and the, what I've chosen to reflect on is the critical role that North American research universities play in our society, not only as purveyors of diplomas and keys to individual advancement, although that is surely our most important mission, but as forces for social good in creating economic prosperity. This is the story of an investment in the future of our people, and indeed all peoples, that has paid extraordinary dividends over time. But it is also the story of an enterprise that may well falter if we do not sustain our commitment to it. My story will be built around American examples since, after spending 40 years in the United States, this is the world that I know best. But I think you will find Canadian analogs to many of the challenges that American scientists and transplants like myself confront. Colleges and universities provide many social goods, from socioeconomic mobility to fostering open discourse. But what I want to focus on this afternoon is the contributions that research universities make to our two nations scientific enterprise as they channel public and private dollars into critical fields of inquiry and link this work with the education of graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, the scientists of tomorrow. In the ideal world, the new knowledge that emerges from this unique interplay of resources and talents is placed at the service of national and global goals and applied and adapted by the marketplace yielding benefits to human health and well-being, and new industries that diversify and strengthen our closely linked economies. 
Indeed, if one considers the 20th century advances that have left the world a better place, they grew primarily out of scientific research, much of it conducted in research universities like this one we are in now, Dr. Monroe Bloom's and my own. The evidence for this sweeping statement is all around us. In the dramatic increase in life expectancy and the corresponding decline in infant mortality. In the virtual eradication of a disease like smallpox through systematic worldwide vaccination. In the generation of household conveniences that have freed us from punishing manual labor. In the provision of safe drinking water and sanitation in the availability of world travel and its potential to foster greater understanding among people of different cultures, and in the development of the Internet, a powerful tool that provides global and instantaneous access to everything from the world's great literature to vacuous tweets. A strong case can be made that at least half the growth in the United States' gross domestic product in the past 50 years has been due to advances in science and engineering. Entirely new industries such as biotechnology, telecommunications, and e-commerce, some of the most powerful drivers in today's economy, grew out of research that was by and large nurtured in university labs, often by students and faculty pursuing knowledge for its own sake with no commercial application in mind. This remarkable scientific progress did not occur by chance. In the United States, it arose out of a social contract between the federal government on the one hand and research universities on the other. Although it's hard for us to imagine it today, prior to the Second World War, the government of the United States did very little investing in fundamental scientific research. In those days, institutions like the Rockefeller Foundation were the most important supporters of research in universities, with state and federal governments providing relatively modest funds. The war changed everything. As the federal government turned to academic scientists, particularly in physics, to develop the weapons that would ultimately end the war. National research laboratories were created at Oak Ridge and Los Alamos, and others that already existed were greatly expanded. The impact of academic scientists on the outcome of the war was probably startling at the time, particularly to politicians and military men. But it helps to explain what happened next. When President Harry Truman turned to Vannevar Bush, director of the Office of Scientific Research and Development, to advise him on post-war science policy, Dr. Bush changed history by writing a highly influential report entitled Science, the Endless Frontier. In it, he laid out the principles by which the federal government would link its future investments in fundamental research with education, particularly the education of graduate students, by investing in the young. The system acquired a vitality, an energy, and a capacity to change continually that would make it the envy of the world. A very similar set of decisions was taken in Canada after the Second World War, and the conclusion was very similar, that linking research with graduate students would provide a lasting benefit to the scientific and technological infrastructure of the country. Although the National Research Council had been in existence in 1916 here in Canada, it was largely an advisory body to the government and oversaw a number of federal laboratories without ties to universities. It was during the scientific and technological booms of the 1950s and the 1960s that the Council formed its own social contract with universities in earnest and thereby made a lasting investment in scientific discovery and in the future. The confidence that society placed in scientific progress as the path to prosperity was reflected for decades in everything from surveys 
that identified a life in science as among the most respected careers one could pursue to the yearly generous allocation of tax dollars to basic and applied research. In return for this broad support, society rightfully expected and indeed received the discovery of new knowledge that would lead to better lives for everyone, yielding what some have called the golden age of science. Now I wish I could stand here and simply say, well done, carry on, but in fact, there are storm clouds on the horizon. This is the message of a prescient American, the former head of the Lockheed Martin Corporation and chair of the National Academy's Committee on Prospering in the Global Economy of the 21st Century, Norm Augustine, who I am proud to say is Princeton class of 1957. In his committee's seminal report, called Rising Above the Gathering Storm, he issued a wake-up call to anyone who believes that our prowess in the sciences and engineering is an immutable fact of life. And in fact, just yesterday, he issued a five-year follow-on report to Rising Above the Gathering Storm, where he has upgraded the storm to a Category 5 hurricane. Indeed, for him, and many other thoughtful observers in the United States scientific and technological trajectory, and here I quote from his report's conclusions, without a renewed effort to bolster the foundations of our competitiveness, it is possible that we will lose our privileged position over the coming decades. As physical impediments to the rapid transfer of products, services, and ideas have disappeared, and countries such as China and India have dramatically increased their intellectual and industrial capital in science. It has become imperative that we in North America renew our commitment to fundamental research and to technological innovation. This is a challenge that resonates on both sides of the 49th parallel, as symbolized by Ottawa's 2007 Science and Technology Strategy designed to maximize the freedom of scientists to investigate and of entrepreneurs to innovate. An initiative such as the Canada Foundation for Innovation, established in 1997 to strengthen Canada's research infrastructure. In the words of the Canadian government's strategic plan, mobilizing science and technology to Canada's advantage, s and capacity is more widely distributed around the world today, with countries such as China and India moving increasingly into this segment of the value chain based on their cost advantages and considerable number of highly qualified individuals. To succeed in an ever more competitive global arena, and I'm continuing to quote, Canada must have researchers, research facilities, research equipment, talent, and firms that are nothing short of excellent by world standards. But to paraphrase William Shakespeare's Cassius, the fault, dear friends, is not with those other countries, but with ourselves. The growth in scientific investments elsewhere is something we should celebrate in this global world we live in, for the advances that will come from them will benefit us all. On the other hand, the worst thing we could do for both global progress and our own economic future is to cede the playing field to those countries. Notwithstanding our historic achievements, Canadian and American science face a three-fold challenge that must be addressed if our nations are to flourish in the science and technology-driven world of the 21st century. The first of these challenges concerns the way in which science itself is taught in our schools, colleges, and universities. Though happily, Canadians do not face the crisis in K-12 education that bedevils the United States. Arguably the most important recommendation in the Augustine Report is to its call for a transformation in the teaching of science and mathematics in American public schools and a new commitment to attracting the best and the brightest to science and engineering in college and beyond. Why? 
As Augustine bluntly told congressional leaders last year, America is widely acknowledged as having one of the worst K-12 through education systems in the world, yet spends more on it per student than all but two other nations. Indeed, the most recent results from the Program for International Student Assessment placed American 15-year-olds in 23rd and 32nd place, respectively, among their peers from 57 international jurisdictions, well behind Canada and other countries such as Australia, Korea, and Germany. When more than half of American 12th graders are unable to correctly draw a rough sketch of the sun and the four inner planets in relation to each other, it does not take a rocket scientist to know that Houston, we have a problem. Nor should it come as any surprise that this anemic showing is having repercussions further along the educational pipeline. Students who have limped through science and mathematics with many a weary groan have little incentive to major in these subjects when they enter college. And many will even shy away from courses that are geared to the non-scientist. At precisely the time when our lives are being transformed by exponential strides in science and technology, the annual survey of American freshmen conducted by the Higher Education Research Institute suggests that with the notable exception of the life sciences, fewer young men and women are embracing the sciences and engineering today than in the past. In its report on 40-year trends, the Institute documents the changing intentions of freshmen between 1966 and 2006, and the data are dispiriting. In 1966, 8.6% .6 of respondents foresaw themselves as engineers. Forty years later, 6.3% did. In 1966, 4.1% of respondents predicted they would pursue careers as research scientists. Forty years later, this percentage has fallen to a paltry 1.8%. These are freshmen who are going to college. North of the border, here in Canada, better public schools have not ensured that young Canadians are flocking to the sciences and engineering. Data from the 33-country Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development places Canada 20th in natural science and engineering degrees as a proportion of the total, and 17th in the number of people engaged in science and technology-related occupations as a proportion of total employment. This welter of statistics suggests that the sciences and engineering, which inspired my generation, the post-Sputnik generation, to reach for the stars, are losing their attraction for many young people. And this is a shame, not only because it weakens a major driver of progress and a significant source of influence abroad, but it comes at a time where there have never been so many fascinating questions to explore, and so many marvelous things to build, whether we are probing the circuitry of the human brain or the origins of the universe itself. What then can we do to prevail on a new generation to embrace these opportunities? While much can and should be done to inspire children at the elementary and secondary level, we in higher education cannot afford to wring our hands to cry the sorry state of science education in our public schools and wait for matters to improve. Let me briefly describe three ways that we at Princeton are trying to improve science education to respond to this challenge. The first is to understand what motivates students to become scientists. In my own case, it began with a childhood fascination with math and a love of puzzles. But I truly started down the path of a career in science when it dawned on me that scientists get to solve puzzles that have the potential to change the world. This leads me to the conclusion that we must introduce students to the big questions that scientists are currently trying to solve early in their education. Too often, the operating metaphor for science education is a pyramid. 
At the bottom is a group of foundational facts, often discovered hundreds of years ago, that must be learned by heart. Things like Mendel's laws of inheritance, Newton's laws of gravity. Is there anyone in this audience who was inspired by Mendel's peas or Newton's apple? I seriously doubt it. These facts are often taught as a laundry list and from a historical perspective, without much effort put into explaining their relevance to modern problems. Only after you have successfully conquered these facts are you allowed to move up the pyramid to the next set of slightly more complex facts. And if you have the persistence of Sisyphus and the patience of Job, you will finally reach the summit and be shown the reasons why you've been learning all those facts, that they are the tools that you're going to need to solve fascinating problems. I think we need to invert the pyramid and begin with the big ideas. And then we need to continually connect the facts and the theories and the hypotheses and the theorems we teach to solve the questions that lie behind those big ideas. So this semester, I'm using this approach with a group of 15 Princeton freshmen in a seminar called How the Tabby Cat Got Its Stripes or The Silence of the Genes. Now this is neither a course on African folk tales, nor is it a genetic analysis of Hannibal Lecter. But it is a course in the wild and wacky world of epigenetics. Now freshman seminars allow a senior member of the faculty to explore as for a semester a deep question, often arising from his or her current research interests with bright-eyed and bushy-tailed freshmen. They're considered one of the most memorable teaching experiences by students and faculty alike. But when I taught my first one back in 1992, no one had ever tried to teach one in the sciences. Why? The pyramid. Dogma held that you could not possibly engage a group of freshmen with complex scientific ideas because they were standing at the bottom of the pyramid and were completely unprepared to appreciate what lay at the pinnacle. I was not persuaded then. I am completely unpersuaded now. These 18-year-olds, with only high school biology to guide them, are reading original papers in the literature, almost all published in the last 10 years, that explore everything from genomic imprinting in mammals to position of variegation effects in Drosophila to paramutation in maize. Yes, we begin each class with a vocabulary lesson because of the propensity of scientists to use arcane language when simple words would do. But once armed with that dictionary, the students are able to understand the concepts and most importantly, the ways in which scientists go about exploring big ideas. It is possible to invert the pyramid. Furthermore, they learn that scientists do not have all the answers. Thank heavens, for if we did, we'd all be out of jobs. The second approach that we are exploring at Princeton is breaking down the artificial barriers that separate one scientific discipline from another. Those barriers have existed on our campus for centuries but they are increasingly irrelevant to the way 21st century science and engineering are conducted. The most exciting problems that scientists and engineers face today often do not fit neatly into one of the foundational sciences, but rather lie at the interstices of multiple fields. Today's neuroscientists require familiarity with physics and computer science as well as biology and psychology. Successful environmental remediation will need hydrologists, civil engineers, geoscientists, and chemists working alongside ecologists. It's critical that we be preparing our students for this future. Six years ago, a distinguished professor of molecular biology at Princeton, David Botstein, created a new curriculum for freshmen and sophomores called the Integrated Science Curriculum. 
He began by asking a group of senior faculty from chemistry, physics, biology, and computer science to meet for a year and to develop a list of the most important ideas in their fields and the scientific principles that underpin them. They discovered, I think to their surprise, that they had far more in common than they thought. Using this list, they created a two-year course co-taught by faculty from the participating disciplines that would prepare students to concentrate in any one of those four disciplines, and they are doing that in very significant numbers, but would also prepare them with a broad perspective on modern science. As you can imagine, those of you in academia, this took some doing, as faculty are loath to cede control of the curriculum to colleagues outside their own discipline. Nevertheless, it has worked and it has worked brilliantly. The majority of the students who have passed through this curriculum have not only gone off to the best graduate programs in the world at much higher rates than we had seen previously, but those programs are begging us to send more of those students because they are ready, willing, and able to embrace the interdisciplinary world ahead. The third approach we're taking at Princeton is not new, but I am convinced it is critical for producing future scientists, and that is providing students with the opportunity to actually be scientists. There have been many studies over the years that establish a strong correlation between an early research experience and the likelihood of persisting in a career in science. In my case, it was the opportunity to engage in scientific research as a second year honors chemistry major at Queens that solidified my own determination to pursue a life in science. I had the great good luck to work with Professor Saul Wolf, one of this country's most accomplished organic chemists and now an emeritus university professor at Simon Fraser University. My project was to work out the conditions under which an hydropenicillin, a biologically inert molecule, could be converted to biologically active penicillin. If we were successful, the possibility was there to simplify and reduce the cost of manufacturing that important antibiotic. For several months, I tried what felt like an infinite number of permutations and combinations of reaction conditions, assessing the outcome on lawns of E. coli bacteria in petri dishes to look for cell death. To this day, I can still remember the morning I opened the incubator, expecting to be greeted by the usual sight of happily growing E. coli, and instead I saw a clearing around one of the filters indicating that penicillin had been synthesized in my test tube. The hair stood on the back of my neck. My hand shook. Rockets went off in my head. And after that, it would have been impossible not to be a scientist. At Princeton, we require every student to conduct research in his or her senior year and write a substantial thesis. But in truth, the earlier undergraduates enter our research labs, the greater the likelihood that they will have a transformative experience. I should add, of course, that for some of our students, the senior thesis is revelatory in a different way. They discover that they are not meant for a life in science, and that is a valuable lesson as well. All of these teaching initiatives are intended to inspire talented undergraduates to eagerly embark upon careers in science. But this will not happen if they come to believe that the path ahead is stacked against them. This has become a major issue, particularly for the biomedical sciences in the United States, where postgraduate training has gone from a sprint to a marathon in the last 30 years. Completion times for doctorates and postdoctoral fellowships are lengthening, with the median time required for the former increasing from six to eight years between 1970 and 1995. 
for postdoctoral fellows, they are now the victims of what I call the LaGuardia effect, which as anyone who has flown on the east coast of the United States knows, means endlessly circling the airport, waiting for your turn to land. The shocking consequence of this protracted time spent as a postdoctoral fellow is that the average age at which a scientist secures his or her first National Institutes of Health grant has climbed from 39 in 1990, hardly a number to cheer about, to 43 in 2007. And many gifted young men and women are simply not prepared to wait that long to be intellectually independent. In the world's words of Dr. Elias Zerhouni, the former head of the NIH, without effective national policies to recruit young scientists to the field and support their research over the long term, in 10 to 15 years we'll have more scientists over the age of 65 than younger than 35. Already, he noted, the NIH funds significantly more people over the age of 70 than under the age of 30. Pursuing a scientific career has never been a cakewalk, but as more and more time is spent in ever-lengthening preparation with only a distant prospect of scientific independence, I worry that many highly qualified undergraduates are thinking twice about investing the best years of their lives in the skies above LaGuardia. This is a loss of talent that our nation cannot afford. The third and final challenge confronting the scientific enterprise in both Canada and the United States concerns the consistency of federal funding and thus the health of the government-university partnership that I described at the outset of my remarks. To anyone who has run a research lab, it is a truth universally acknowledged, as the great Jane Austen would say, that scientific research cannot be conducted effectively in fits and starts. It needs a long horizon, and the assurance of predictable support as it unfolds. Unfortunately, federal funding in the United States has been anything but stable. And at both an institutional and an individual level, the consequences have been very damaging. Canadian science, too, has been subject to erratic twists of the federal spigot. Last year, the budgets of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council were cut. This year, they received a boost, though not enough to recover the lost ground. The NIH offers a prime American example of this problem. Its budget, proposed by the President and set by the Congress, has never enjoyed a sustained period of stability in its history, but has been in what biochemists call a futile cycle of growth and retrenchment over the past 35 years, boom and bust cycles. The last decade has provided us with a particularly poignant example of this phenomenon. Between 1998 and 2003, Congress doubled the budget of the NIH, surpassing the expectations of even the most ardent advocates of biomedical research. But the good times ended abruptly in 2004, when Congress began to tighten its purse strings to the point that the NIH's budget could no longer even keep pace with inflation. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, the stimulus funding that was the response to the Great Recession we have just weathered, brought $10.4 billion of relief to the NIH, an astounding 33 percent increase in its annual budget. But this short-term mana from heaven contains the makings of another bust in 2011. The infusion of new funds has unleashed a flood of grant applications, once more raising the prospect of an unsustainable expansion of activity followed by a sharp and deeply painful contraction. We can already anticipate a train wreck. 
this roller coaster, which is a direct consequence of the political budget process in Washington, means that careful and effective planning that permits the wise allocation of resources is virtually impossible. Scientific priorities that need years to nurture are initiated and then suddenly caught without essential funding. During the boom years, universities respond to the increased demand for research by building new facilities and hiring new faculty, only to find that those new faculty cannot attract funding when the tide turns as it inevitably does. This cycle has particularly corrosive effects on young investigators, or as I have said a few minutes ago, not so young investigators, who have the misfortune to enter the grant system at one of the downturns in funding. Moreover, I would argue that the kind of science we conduct is adversely affected by the sudden appearance and disappearance of federal dollars. When money abruptly dries up, the mindset of applicants and reviewers alike grows more cautious to the detriment of risky but potentially transformative research, as well as to young investigators without a well-established record of achievement. To quote one report by the American research community, there has been a fundamental narrowing of the scientific vision with the primary scientific query shifting from what is possible to what is fundable. This is profoundly injurious to scientific progress, which depends on daring leaps as well as incremental steps to achieve its goals. So what is the alternative? In the simplest terms, I would argue for a national commitment to stable, multi-year funding that guarantees at the very minimum the preservation of spending power from one year to the next, and that is responsive to new national needs, for example, the emerging epidemic uh, uh, such as HIV AIDS or a compelling new scientific opportunity such as sequencing the human genome. The major obstacle that stands in the way of such a policy is clearly the federal government's annual appropriation process. The United States bicameral system of government with power divided between the executive and legislative branches and then further divided among powerful congressional committees in no way lends itself to orderly fiscal management. Finding agreement, any kind of agreement, is a Herculean task that involves more short-term political maneuvering than long-term public policy formation. It strikes me, and I'm prepared to be corrected in the question and answer session, that Canada's parliamentary system is much more disciplined, but changing government, oh, I gather there are going to be disagreements in the question and answer session. But government priorities can still be disruptive even within a climate of strong support for research and development. As the president of the Canadian Association of Physicists noted with some relief this spring, this year's budget represents a clear, if somewhat modest, commitment to basic research in addition to commercialization aspects and targeted research that all too often seem to push basic research to the back burner of the government agenda. So these then are three of the major challenges that face the future well-being of the scientific enterprise on which our nation's welfare rests, I would argue. Much will hinge on how we as scientists respond, on the way we introduce the rising generation to the wonders of science, on the way we organize the training of new scientists, and on the way we make our case for federal support. There is no simple solution here, but as long as scientists do their part, as long as our society maintains its fundamental belief in the power of science to improve lives, and promote prosperity for all, and as long as our nation's leaders take a thoughtful approach to our scientific enterprise and protect the qualities that make it such a source of economic growth and prosperity, we can look to the future, including the rise of global competition, with optimism. Let us not forget that in the second half of the 20th century, men and women on this continent created the most impressive 
and powerful engines for innovation and creativity that the world has ever known. The seeds of that success rooted in our nation's research universities are still with us, slightly battered, but not unbowed, but unbowed. And if we nurture them, as I believe we can, the golden age of North American science will not be something that my generation talks about nostalgically. Rather, we'll be able to say, and to say with confidence, the best is still to come. Thank you all for coming out this afternoon. and insightful. And in the tradition of the Freeze and Prize, we have a Q&A. And so for those people who would like to uh, come to a microphone and ask a question, pertinent and impertinent, you're welcome. No questions. When this happens in class, there are two possible explanations. <laughs> One, it was so incredibly crystal clear that there is simply nothing to question, and of course the other is the opposite. <laughs> Sir. Thank you. Um, I want to the importance of the education of the broader public. You spoke specifically yeah. about training the next generation of scientists, enculturating federal government people to for a consistent and prolonged funding of federal research. But it seems to me that the dollars allocated to scientific research flow fundamentally from the public's valuing of that research. And I wonder if you could speak to the issue of how well or not well we as a scientific community have done of, of yeah. conveying to the general public the value of science. I, th I think that's a wonderful question and, and one that um, uh, whose implications I absolutely and you know, early in my talk, I think I said two things. One is that many surveys done over the sort of the second half of the 20th century identified scientists as one of the most respected professions um, in, the, in the country. And I think that grew out of a confidence that the public had that scientists were working for the common good. Um, and that confidence then allowed those tax dollars, which really are the way we fund uh, research, both in Canada and the United States, to flow into scientific um, uh, activities. If that confidence is ever undermined, uh, I think we are in a very difficult position. And I think for that reason, it is extraordinarily important that we take a much more proactive role than we have, I think, in the last, say, the past 50 years in talking about um, why science is important, to talk about uh, what the uh, underlying purpose of science, and here I'm talking about both basic sciences as well as uh, science that is applied where one can immediately see the benefits of the science. Um, and to engage in the public sphere. I think it's extremely important, and President Rock mentioned in his introduction that one of the things that I headed up at Princeton before I became president was a group of faculty who were really working very hard on creating innovative courses, not for science majors, but for non-science majors, because our students are going to go out and be the lawyers and the policy makers and the journalists of tomorrow who are going to be really framing um, issues uh, around the role that science and engineering plays in society. How are we doing? Uh, you know, I think the track record in the United States would be as follows. I think we've done a very good job in the health area. Um, uh, and that's reflected in the fact that the National Institute's budget is, is you know, five times larger than the National Science Foundation, which you could argue covers a much greater percentage of the broad swath of science. Um, it, some of that is real appealing to self-interest. Everybody knows somebody who has something wrong with them. 
And so I think there, there is very significant public support. I think where we have failed, frankly, is in um, the physical sciences. And I think we've done a much less good job of explaining why investments in mathematics and computer science and chemistry and physics engineering. Engineering is often an easier uh, case to be made, but you know, why is it important that we have cosmologists who are trying to understand the beginnings of the universe? Um, why should we support the extraordinary expense that it takes to um, send a satellite out beyond uh, the solar system. There I think we have a much bigger job ahead to really explain to the public why those investments too will pay off, although probably on a very different time scale. Thank you. Enjoyed your lecture very much, Dr. Hildman. You emphasized in this morning the connection between social good and economic prosperity. And I wonder if you could explore that in a little more depth and in particular the linkage or unlinkage of these two and the temporal relationship between the two. Yeah. And of course the, um, the temporal relationship is with field. So let, let me take my own field. Um, if you think about when was the beginning of the molecular biology revolution, I you know, I date it back to the discovery of the structure of DNA by Watson and Crick back in the 1950s. You then, I think, have to fast forward to the middle of the 1970s when uh, recombinant DNA was discovered, and that launched the biotechnology industry. Now, there were a lot of promises made, and I listened to them very carefully back in the 1970s when I was a postdoctoral fellow about how quickly uh, the benefits from recombinant DNA research were going to translate into, into um, benefits for human, um, you know, all humans. And the answer was it took much longer than the promises implied. But I would argue that those promises are now uh, upon us, and I think we're going to see those promises realized um, to an even greater extent as we begin to actually see the realization of what uh, the Human Genome Project is going to bring to personalized medicine. I know it's a long way off and I know we've already overpromised in this area. But nevertheless, I think, I think that is, um, um, that's a time scale that takes a little bit of patience. Um, in in e-commerce, happened like that. You know, uh, uh, to uh, an example I know extremely well, uh, you know, Larry Page and Sergey Brin were two graduate students in the computer science department, actually I think they were in electrical engineering, at Stanford uh, working on how to create something that would allow us to move around the internet more effectively. And literally within five years, Google had been founded, and within another five years, it was one of the biggest companies in the world. And I think arguably, and I'm obviously biased, but arguably producing enormous benefits uh, to society in, um, in the ability for, for wherever you are on this planet being able to access the, the rich information that is on the web. So, th you know, there's a case where the benefit literally happened overnight. Yes. I was intrigued by your metaphor you were talking about the lengthening gestation period for doctoral students and uh, postdocs, and, and you called for stable funding of science. Uh, and we have, a, a, you know, the North American continent, certainly in lots of places, an aging population. How do you square the circle of saying we have constant funding, we've got this pipeline of people that's getting longer, yet the place where these young people are supposed to go has got a fixed absorptive capacity? So that's a, that's a very complicated question, as you well know. So answer it um, as straightforwardly as possible. What I said was not recommending stable funding, but at a minimum, stable funding. In other words, do no harm is what I was recommending. So I would, you know, I, I would be in favor of science funding that is slightly above um, uh, just inflating the CPI. Um, here's the dilemma. 
I think what has happened in the biological sciences is we have a labor model that doesn't work. So what do I mean by that? And, and I have to warn everybody that I went around the United States for about two years with a bulletproof vest on because I had shared a report at the National Research Council that looked at this question and, and made the following observations that I'm going to make, and these were not well received. So I, I'm used to getting, getting uh, yelled at about this. What has happened is we created a labor system where the, this, if, if you want to think about it, the average lab is a PI, one technician, and eight trainees, right? And so if you ask how many trainees does any one PI produce in his or her lifetime, the answer is going to be many fold more than simply to replace themselves. And in fact, many fold more than the system can accommodate reasonably. So one of the things that we argued for and were shot down <laughs> many times for is for, for the life science enterprise to think really hard about what is the right labor force creation model that would create a more fair and sensible system for the profession. And there is a precedent for this. Back in the 1990s, late 80s, early 1990s, there was a real drop in funding for physics. And what the physicists did, and to their enormous credit, in my view, is they got together and said, we cannot be producing this many physics PhDs. There are no jobs for these people. It's not good for the profession. And they actually um, practiced birth control on themselves, and they did it collectively. They, they got together and they really agreed that this was the right thing to do. They slowed down PhD training, and as a consequence, you know, when a young man, a brilliant young man, is deciding whether to do a PhD in physics, he or she is, is looking at a system that looks fair. It looks at, I, you know, if I'm going to embark on this long period of training, I have a reasonable, not 100 percent, the world isn't perfect, um, and, but I have a reasonable expectation that I will be able to practice my profession at the end of the line. Biological scientists cannot say that today. And I think as a consequence, what is happening is we're turning away some of the very brightest students who, after all, are going to be the ones who have the most other options that they can exercise. And so my worry is that um, we will lose what my generation, and I'm not speaking about myself, but my generation had the huge advantage of, which is the best and the brightest. much and you said many things that are good for us. Now you have the advantage of falling what's north of the border at the same time as you see the scene in the United States. So I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, you might have the advantage that you're soon heading back to LaGuardia and Princeton <laughs> to give us Canadians advice as what we should do in the area of science and development including our private sector. You're right, you know, there's been tremendous growth in, United, in Canada in the recent years, in the last decade, with all the things, all the institutions that we've heard about. It hasn't really gone backwards, it's gone forwards. Right. A little short of those who are at the pinnacle, I assume they're being born. We actually imported 19 of them this year, uh, just to help us uh, move that along. In the private sector, actually, we have a low, very low investment of research, contrasted with what basically happened in the United States. But from your perspective from both sides of the border, what does Canada need? The last Olympics said we, we were shy in first saying own the podium. By the time Crosby scored the goal, we said, hey, that's a good strategy. What do you advise? Yeah, I like that Olympic strategy, actually. I was I, game having about 500 heart attacks. And and realizing there is no question that I'm a Canadian. <laughs> um, which side I was hoping for in that game. Um, 
Here, the best I can do, John, is to give you a sense of why, what I think are the critical ingredients that have made the American system so robust in, um, in creating uh, prosperity. Um, and, I, I, and, and some of them I talked about in my talk, but let me just enumerate them. Um, one, uh, investing in the young. Um, and, and one of the reasons I am so concerned about this pipeline problem in the biological sciences is I think it is really killing the golden goose by maintaining young people in um, subsidiary roles uh, during their peak creativity. So invest in the young. Um, really, really good immigration policy so that you are bringing the best and the brightest from all over the world into your system. Uh, that has paid off immensely, I think, for both Canada and the United States. And during the period immediately after 9-11, I was terrified that the United States was going to do something really foolish and, and close the doors. Um, it's been a troubled time, but things are better than, than they were. So I think, you know, be global in your thinking about where the next great scientist is going to come from. Um, generous funding, funding that can actually make a difference, and funding, and this is something that I think Canada has done extremely well in the last 10 years, and that is, as your highest priority, invest in the very best. And make sure that the very best have the resources that they need to do their work, and the reason for that is really simple. And that is something like 95 of the major scientific discoveries in the world are done by 5% of the scientists. So if you're not supporting those 5%, um, you're in trouble. Um, and that is not to, to dismiss the importance of the other 95%. They, they fulfill very, very important functions in the overall work of the system. But, but if you're not investing and significantly in the very best, um, you're never going to get uh, the outcome that you want. Um, the last thing, which is, is um, uh, maybe two other things, uh, a, a willingness to fail. A and that really is another way of saying a willingness to take risks. So a system that, it, that will forgive failure in those who have with good reason, taken very significant risks. I mean, one, of the, one of the organizations that I had the real luck to participate in was the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which had a wonderful philosophy. They went out and, and sort of identified people who they thought were going to be the next major contributors. And they didn't ask for a research grant. They didn't ask, you know, for you to tell them what tris concentration you were going to use in your reaction. They said, we're going to bet on you and do anything you want. We really don't, you know, it's up to you what you work on. We'll judge you in five years. That's true. Um, but we're not going to insist upon micromanaging uh, what you do. So I think... They encouraged us to take risks. When I became a Hughes investor, I literally changed every project I was working on in my lab. I just said, this is my chance. This is my chance to work on what I want to work on instead of what will get me funded. So uh, willingness to take risk. And then I think the last thing is, is to have an environment where entrepreneurship and um, the willing, the eagerness, not willingness, the eagerness to take research findings into the marketplace is fueled both by scientists who are encouraged to do so at their own home institutions, you know, without foregoing their responsibilities as teachers. That's primary in my view. But they're encouraged to do this, and the institution provides the resources that they need so that they can do it. And then critically, the one thing, if I have to identify that is missing in Canada, is a really robust venture capital system. And, um, you know, if you go back to Larry Page and Sergey Brin, wouldn't have mattered how brilliant that algorithm was for searching the web if it hadn't been for their being able to find venture capital on Sand Hill Road. Uh, because it, you know, it would have been a nice PhD thesis, it would have sat in Stanford's library, 
um, gathering dust, and that would have been the end of Google. So, so strong venture, and one of the things that, that I think it might be worthwhile for um, uh, people in authority, people with some influence within the government to think about is whether the, gover whether the government's incentives for venture capitalists are properly aligned. That's a high-risk business. Um, there are more failed venture capitalists than there are successful venture capitalists. And so there has to be sort of incentivized ways for them to, to actually, you know, make a living at it. You're welcome. Any questions? Yes. Uh, my name is Carol Lawson. I'm not a I work in a uh, university residence, so I engage with a lot of conversations with undergraduate students. And I was quite impressed from an educational point of view of, well, two ideas that, that I picked up. One of them was this, the, the inverted pyramid, the uh, beginning with the big ideas, because in conversations with many of these students, it's the principles, the bigger ideas that they're, they're, they're raising at this yeah. age of 18, 19. And the other was the breaking down the artificial barriers, because I watched just see the knowledge explosion and the high degree of specialization. And a lot of times these students are trying to sort of get at these bigger ideas when they're forced with studying in computers and the stress levels. Right. But I wanted to ask you, like one of the questions you raised was the whole thing of what is possible versus what is fundable. And what I'm hearing the students many times saying is just because it's possible, should we be doing it? And I'm seeing in the universities many times the philosophy of science and ethics courses acquiring a, a more a presence kind of thing in the world of science. And I'm wondering if you could just comment on that, the whole thing of, is the question really, you know, is it possible or it should be, is it ethical, is it really going to promote this social good that we're talking about? You know, I think you raise an extremely important question and why um, is, is a different um, aspect of interdisciplinarity than the one that I was talking about, which is to bring humanists and social scientists into the discourse around science and engineering. Uh, we have dozens of examples of uh, where, where sort of the worlds are colliding. Uh, some of them, in my view, in quite artificial ways around, for example, you know, intelligent design and Cre creationism. I hope I'm not offending anybody, but it's too bad because I feel very strongly about that issue, which I think is a false dichotomy. Some of them are actually quite profound. Um, uh, I think there are profound issues around genetic information and, and how we are going to manage the world when it is going to be possible to sequence your genome for $2,000. And not only are you going to be able to sequence it for $2,000, but you're going to be able to rapidly interpret it. Um, there are going to be profound issues. And I think one of the things I most admired about the way Jim Watson set up the Human Genome Project in the United States at the very outset, he was the first director, is that he set aside 5% of the Genome Project's budget to uh, ethical, social, and legal issues surrounding genomics. And this was the first time, remarkably, that the National Institute of Health had ever invested one dime in thinking through the ethical implications of the work that it does. Um, I, I think th this issue is very important, and probably the best thing we can do as a society is to get out ahead of these issues before they are upon us. Uh, some issues uh, we can already anticipate, and probably the, the one that I think is, is, is a fascinating and very thorny issue is the, the ethics around nuclear transplantation. Um, it is a technology we now know we can do. Um, it, is a, it is a technology that is possible, um, but do we believe that Today, 2010, in our society, we feel comfortable cloning human beings or even generating human embryos so that we will have spare parts. I mean, these are questions that are now upon us. And the one thing I am sure of, uh, the answers are not going to come from scientists only. I think scientists have to be in those debates because otherwise the, 
the, the likelihood that science will be misrepresented is very high, in, in fact. Um, but, but scientists have no more legitimacy in weighing in on those issues than any other member of society. And the more we can foster those dialogues, I think the better off we're going to be. Thank you very Sir, much. I thank you. I think we have to draw the question period to a close. I'm sorry about that because of the time. And thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to invite uh, Dr. Friesen to the podium for his remarks on impressions. Dr. Angel, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've been touched and deeply moved by the generous words uh, that have been directed at me and to me regarding the creation of CIHR, but I'm delighted that I can properly assign uh, to President Rock the lead role in this effort. He, he was a man of great courage. You talked, uh, Dr. Tillman, about taking risk. He took a huge risk as we began to champion the idea of uh, transforming MRC into CHR. There was a huge brand loyalty to MRC amongst uh, the recipients. And to put all of that at play and see ultimately the outcome was a result of uh, President Rock's conviction about doing the right thing for this country. I made an estimate the other day that because CIHR exists with its current budget close to a billion dollars relative to what it might have been had MRC continued uh, in the status quo path, the net benefit for the health research community in this country is of the order of two and a half billion dollars. Thank you, Alan Rock, for your belief in moving forward. Dr. Tillman, you have uh, provided us with immense food for thought as you, with great insight and analytical skill, have positioned the case for the importance of the university for the social good of our society. You have provided challenges to us to address some of the perplexing issues that we all face. And the questions that are posed reminds me of Archibald MacLeish's famous couplet, the answer is the answers we know, the questions we know not how to ask. But you've begun that dialogue about the nature of the questions that need to be addressed. Particularly in the question and answer period, I thought the true Shirley Tillman came to the fore. In your very careful and thoughtful responses to a variety of questions, they were given with great authenticity and great integrity. And I think that's been part of the kernel of your great success, but it's moved beyond success to great significance for the benefit not only of your university, but indeed for universities around the world. You have set the benchmark. You've been an inspiration to us all by the power of your intellect, but also by the generosity of your spirit. And for that, we thank you. Finally, to uh, Abby Angel, uh, who has been the inspiration and the guiding force for the creation of the Friends of MRC and then Friends of CIHR, but he took it to a whole new level with the creation, with the support and assistance of colleagues in the creation of this prize. And as I looked at the series of winners, including this year's recipient, I think we have been so fortunate in the selection committee's decision-making effort and for the inspiration and guidance, Abby, that you have given to this entire enterprise. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, uh, Henry, for those kind words. We draw this event uh, uh, to a close, uh, and in doing so, recognize that this uh, represents the work of uh, many, many uh, people. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Christina Castelvi, uh, my assistant, uh, the support of the various uh, sponsors, which uh, must be uh, addressed for their generosity, the University of Ottawa specifically, for this is uh, the uh, second consecutive year of, uh, of a sponsorship and uh, uh, many others, uh, and uh, we are very grateful for that and we couldn't do it without that kind of endorsement. Uh, we now enter into a period of reception for exchange and uh, Dr. Tillman will be there so you can ask the questions that you're embarrassed to uh, at the microphone uh, and uh, have uh, a treat. Uh, also, I'd like to point out that uh, this initiative is really dedicated to the community at large, and that's why it is uh, streamed, live streamed, and will be available on our website. And I encourage you to tune in tomorrow when Dr. Timmon will, will be at Queen's University talking about gender gap in, in, in science, and that will be online for the next couple of years. So we're very interested in making sure that our experience today is shared nationally. So let's uh, adjourn formally, thank everybody who participated uh, at the podium, and come for uh, a treat.